Thank you for joining us for tonight's lecture. Just as a reminder, the lecture will be recorded. So if you don't wish to appear, please turn your camera off. Uh, and to reduce feedback, if you're not actively speaking, make sure to mute your microphone. If you have questions during the presentation, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Um, but otherwise, there will also be a Q&A at the end. And with that, I'll leave Brian England to talk. Hello, well, thank you, um, Ali, for having me here this evening. I'm very happy to be here. So our, our talk for tonight is something we usually deliver to guests here at Wilkerson Nature Preserve, um, where I am the manager. We are a city of Raleigh Park, and we talk about the, the habitats um, that we look for here in the park. So this is a talk called um, This Pea Vine Country. So I, I should start out by saying um, I am coming to you here from Annie Louise Wilkerson, MD, Nature Preserve Park. We're a 157-acre property located in North Raleigh. Um, this property was donated to the city of Raleigh by Dr. Annie Wilkerson for the primary purposes of wildlife and nature education and research into the methods of conservation. So, so that is our mission here at Wilkerson Nature Preserve. And... When you say she wanted this land to be a nature preserve, that was um, an interesting decision because it was not a nature preserve during her life. It was a cow farm. And these are some pictures, which I think you're all able to see, of what the property looked like. Um, there's Dr. Annie herself, you can see here. Um, this is in one of her later years, enjoying her farm. And you can see the herd of cows. There was a actual herd of cows here right until 2006. There were still cows on the property. Um, so when the city acquired it, the cows came with the land and the city had to decide, well, what does this mean? If we're going to turn this into a nature preserve, what happens to all these cows? Um, do cows belong in a nature preserve? That was that was the question. And the city decided, no, we were not going to keep the cows. Um, now, you know, there are county parks that like uh, Oakview that have goats and livestock and do agricultural history. But as a nature preserve, we were not going to keep the cows. We sent the cows to NC State. I believe they became hamburgers. They were beef cows in the first place. Um, and as a management goal, we justified this. Why weren't we keeping the cows? There have been cows here for 200 years. We were going to set our target for the preserve to the natural condition of the land, the land BC, before cows. Well, that's very easy to say. We want to manage the nature preserve, you know, before cows, but that was a long time ago. Nobody alive today can remember what this land was like before the cows came. There have been cows here in North Carolina for a very long time. Uh, and you might be wondering, well, well, how long have there been cows here? Um, cows were not native to North America, and they were brought here as part of European colonization. And so this, this chart shows a little timeline of, of colonization in North Carolina, the spread of European settlement, um, starting in the late 1600s, and then expanding rapidly. Um, during the 1700s, you know, back in, in 1730, um, there were no cows or European settlement here in the Wake County area to speak of. Um, the population of the state was estimated at just about 35,000 people or the future state. And then it grows very rapidly from there. So by you know, 1750, over 100,000 people. 1765, 200,000 people. By 1776, 300,000 people. Uh, you're getting the picture. During the 1700s, this land that we now call North Carolina was dramatically changed in a very short period of time. Huge numbers of people and their cows moved into this land. Um, this, is, this is literally a 10 times increase in population, you know, between 1730 and 1780, you know, from 35,000 to 350,000 roughly in 50 years. Tenfold increase in population, enormous population growth. And this put us by 1790 as the third most populous state in the USA in 1790. We were the largest share of the United States population in 1790 that North Carolina has ever been um, before or since. Um, 
And right after that, Raleigh was founded. On December 31st, 1792, our city, Raleigh, was officially started. Um, so Raleigh is not that old. So when we say how long have there been farms and cows and things like that here around Wilkerson, you know, roughly 200-ish years going back to the, the late 1700s. And we have um, ruins of cabins here on the property uh, made of stone that, that really do suggest settlement in this area going back to the fairly early days. But then after that, something happens. Um, North Carolina's population growth really stalls out in the early 1800s. Um, and we start dropping in the rankings. Um, we dropped to fourth place by 1820, and then we're 12th place in population by 1860. Raleigh, the city of Raleigh's population shrank by 20% between 1820 and 1830. The city's only 30 years old and it's already shrinking. And, you know, between 1830 and 1840, about half of North Carolina's counties were losing population. So this is a little bit of North Carolina history. So the big picture here is there is this rapid growth in the mid 1700s, and then that growth stalls out and people really start moving away in large numbers. By 1850, over 400,000 people had moved out of North Carolina to other states. Um, by 1860, North Carolina had the lowest percentage of people born in other states of any state in the United States. We were known as the state that everybody moved out of when in the 1700s, we had been the state that everybody moved into. So what happened? What, how did we go from being the state? So many people were moving into, into the state everyone was moving out of. And it really all goes back to cows. Um, and we're gonna take a little quote here from um, a writer uh, who was living in Guilford County back in the 1800s, and he summed it up like this. Um, he, he wrote about a person who he said, came from the North about 1790, back when everybody thought this Peavine country, meaning North Carolina, was a sort of new garden of Eden. Now, he could write this in the 1800s and refer to North Carolina as Peavine country and just assume that his readers would all know exactly what he was talking about. Now, we, we've probably heard North Carolina called the Tar Heel State or maybe the, the Pine Tree State. It's our state tree. But how many of us today talk about North Carolina as the Peavine State, who, who call the North Carolina Piedmont Peavine country? It's not something we say today. But back in the 1800s, a person could casually mention this, and it was just expected that everyone would know. Of course, yes, yes, North Carolina was the great Peavine country in the Piedmont. And that was back when everybody came to it. They thought it was amazing. They thought it was a paradise. And that was why they rushed in to the Piedmont back in the 1700s. But it didn't last. And um, that, that Peavine paradise um, disappeared quickly. And then the, the migration moved on to other places. So what was that Peavine country? And, and what was Peavine? What did Peavine mean to, to people in the 1700s and 1800s? You'd probably like to see a picture, I'm guessing. Um, unfortunately, there were no cameras in the 1700s. Nobody took a photograph of the amazing landscape here in Raleigh before the cows came. Um, but I did find this painting from the late 1700s. Um, which is, I believe, the earliest illustration labeled wild pea vine. Um, so the, the text that went along with this painting, the, the, the writer said that this caterpillar they discovered by seeing the butterfly lay some eggs upon the wild pea vine. And you can see the illustration there of a, a twining plant with colorful flowers, three leaves, and the lovely butterflies eating. That. Now, wild pea vine was not just one species. So this isn't the only thing that wild pea vine looked like. It was a general term. People used wild pea vine to describe lots of different sorts of wild peas. Um, in fact, the, the writer who did this painting tries to give it a Latin name. He gives it the wrong Latin name, but that doesn't really matter. Um, wild pea vine wasn't just one species. It was a general term for many, many different sorts of wild pea family plants that um, were very abundant back in those um, early days. They were often beautiful and um, they uh, really influenced our settlement. 
So since I can't show you a photograph of the pea vine landscape, since cameras didn't exist back then, I'm going to try and paint a word picture for you. And word pictures, that's the business of artists and poets, and I am not a poet. So instead, I'm going to read a poem for you by an actual poet, um, Robert Morgan, um, who was inducted in the North Carolina Literary Hall of Fame in 2010 for his life's work. He's written many novels, many collections of poetry. Um, he was a professor at Cornell, teaching there for 40 years. He's been a, a visiting uh, lecturer at many of our North Carolina universities. And this is a poem he wrote called Wild Pea Vines. Um, Morgan was born in North Carolina, and so this, this poem was inspired by North Carolina's history. He's trying to paint a word picture of what that pea vine country looked like. Here goes. I have never understood how the mountains when first seen by hunters and traders and settlers were covered with pea vines. How could every cove and clearing, old field, every opening in the woods, and even understories of deep woods be laced with vines and blossoms in June? They say the flowers were so thick the fumes were smothering. They tell of shining fogs of bees above the sprawling mess and every bush and sapling tangled with tender curls and tresses. I don't see how it was possible for wild peas to take the woods in shade and deep hollows and spread over cliffs and hanging gardens and choke out other flowers. It's hard to believe the creek banks and the high ledges were that bright. But hardest of all is to see how such profusion, such overwhelming lushness and lavish could vanish, so completely disappear that you must look through several valleys to find a sprig or strand of wild pea vine curling on a weed stalk, like some word from a lost language once flourishing on every tongue. Mm. So that is Wild Pea Vines by Robert Morgan. Um, so that is a poetic interpretation of the the old pea vine days. Um, now, where does that come from? Now, he compares at the end, he has this metaphor, comparing the pea vine to a word from a lost language. Um, well, it's not completely lost. If you look up Merriam Webster's dictionary, you will find pea vine still has an entry, still has an entry even today. Pea vine, noun, any of various usually twining American herbaceous leguminous plants. Well, that's a definition for you. So it's not completely lost. Um, and as you see, it's not a single species. It was a whole group of pea plants. And everyone used to know what it meant. Um, in fact, if you were a student here in the Carolinas in the 1800s, I, I saw this in a textbook that was widely used in the late 1800s in the Carolinas. They had a question on the test. What is said of the pea vine? And students were expected to answer this question. Um, pea vine was considered so important to the history of the Carolinas that it was part of the standard school curriculum. Um, and I'm sure students back then were just like students now. When the teachers were lecturing them about the pea vine, they would want to know, is this going to be on the test? And I'm sure the teachers could tell them, yes, look, see, this is the actual test question that they used. It will be on the test. You will be expected to know what was said of the pea vine. Now, I, I have some kids in school today, and I'm, I do not believe tests, I don't believe the teachers are stressing pea vine in the curriculum that is used currently. But there was a time when children were literally taught in school about the pea vine. It was a word that everybody knew. So what were they taught? What was said of the pea vine? Well, if you were a child here in the Carolinas back in the late 1800s, and you were assigned to write an essay on the pea vine, you might go to one of the standard history books you would have had at the time. One of the best ones um, might have been um, Foote's Sketches of North Carolina, published in 1846. And here is what he says. So imagine you're, imagine you're this child in the late 1800s, you've been assigned to write about the wild pea vine. And so you go to your history book that you would have had, and this is what you would read. So Foote says, Immigration was encouraged and directed very much in its earliest periods by the vast prairies with pea vine grass and cane brakes, which stretched across the states of Virginia and Carolina. There are large forests now, meaning in 1846, in these two states where a hundred years ago, not a tree and scarce a shrub could be seen. So this was the, the standard history 
um, and he's laying it out very clearly. Um, Foot was born back in the 1700s. As a child, he, he saw what the land looked like in the 1700s. Um, he could personally remember it, and he spoke to older people who could remember back before him. And what they remembered was that in the early days when the settlers had been rushing in, North Carolina and Virginia in the Piedmont had been, well, you see what he says, vast prairies. And not just vast prairies of anything, vast prairies of pea vine grass. Um, that was the plant that people came um, in search of. And the immigration, the settlement was actually encouraged and directed by the prairies and pea vine grass specifically. It was the pea vine grass that was directing the settlement. Um, now, by the time he's writing this as, a, as an old man in the 1840s, you can see those vast prairies with pea vine grass no longer exist. They're gone. They're a matter only of history and memory. During his lifetime, that stuff disappeared. And what did it turn into? Well, he tells us um, by the 1840s, the vast prairies and the pea vine grass have become forests, large forests, places that had been almost treeless um, have now become forests. Often when we talk about settlement and colonization, we assume that it's all about settlers coming in with axes and chopping down forests and creating clearings. But what Foot and Foot was there, Foot would live from the 1700s into the 1800s. What he says settlement was like was people finding prairies and the prairies turning into forests after the settlers come. Actually, the opposite of what many people assume the settlement was like. Well, um, he, he, he goes on. Um, why were these pea vine prairies so valuable? Well, the prairies abounded with game and supplied abundant pasturage, both winter and summer, for the various kinds of stock that accompanied the immigrants. And that's the key thing. Those, those prairies and the pea vine grass fed the stock, the livestock. In other words, the cows. The stock accompanied the immigrants. The cows came with the colonists. And the pea vine grass would feed the cows in the summer, and the cane brakes would feed the cows in the winter. So if you had pea vine and cane brakes growing close together, your cows could eat all year round without you having to do any work at all. You don't have to make any hay. You don't have to feed them. They feed themselves. Now, for a farmer from Europe who's used to growing hay and then cutting the hay and stacking the hay and hauling the hay and feeding the hay, if any of you have ever worked on a farm with hay, it's hard, hard work. Coming to a new world where the cows just fed themselves all 12 months of the year without any haymaking required. Yes, it was seemed like paradise. It really did. This is why people would, would, would travel long distances to come to this. It was amazing for them. Um, but it didn't last. It did not last. Now, if you're wondering where was all this, where are these vast prairies? You look at a, a map of the United States and you, you think the vast prairies are going to be out in Kansas or Nebraska or somewhere, not in North Carolina. But if you look at a map made in the 1700s, um, we have one right here. You can see this map um, was published in 1718. Um, it's actually written in French. And you can see the Outer Banks very clearly. And you can see the Blue Ridge Mountains, the ridge of, of mountains there. And then you can see the space in front of the mountains, um, what we would now call the Piedmont, right? The Piedmont is the area in front of the mountains, but west from the coast. And he's labeled that area in front of the mountains, but away from the coast, Grand Savannah. Well, Savannah, um, you know, what we think of the African savanna. Savannah is an open plain with only scattered trees. This grand savanna um, was how they described the Piedmont on the maps. So whether you call it a vast prairie or whether you call it a, a grand savanna, this was a, a description for a, apparently a large area stretching from the Piedmont of Virginia down through the Piedmont of both Carolinas. Um, and that was how this area was seen back in those days. Now, what else did they say of the Piedmont? Um, we just read from Foote 
Um, but other writers um, said similar things. So, so Logan, writing about the Piedmont of, of South Carolina, um, described it like this. As late as 1775, the woodlands carpeted with grass and the wild pea vine growing as high as a horse's back and wildflowers of every hue were the constant admiration of the traveler and adventurous pioneer. The trees were generally larger and stood so wide apart that a deer or buffalo could be easily seen at a long distance, there being nothing to obstruct the view but the rolling surface. The pea vine and grasses occupied the place of the bushes and young forest growth that render the woods of the present time so gloomy and intricate. So Logan essentially agrees with foot. You know, the land had been back in the 1700s a wild pea vine uh, carpeted um, scene with scattered trees. The trees are very scattered, so you could easily see a long distance. But what has happened to it? It has turned into young forest growth that is gloomy and intricate, thick, dense, shady forest. And this new young forest has grown on where the, the wild pea vine and the old open woods or open savanna, prairie, whatever you want to call it, had once been. Now, Logan gives us some more details. The wild pea grew chiefly on the highlands while the cane flourished best in the valleys and filled the lower grounds of all the streams. Both the pea vine and maiden cane are still found in the upcountry, we call the Piedmont Mountains, but only in situations where they are shut in from hogs and cattle. So by 1859, you can tell Logan thinks the pea vine is disappearing. It's no longer found in these vast prairies. It's only found in situations where? Where they are shut in from hogs and cattle. I told you, this all comes back to cows. It's all about the cows. Um, so this being shut in may seem strange to us today, but in the 1700s and early 1800s, North Carolina and South Carolina, too, were, were open range states, meaning if you were a farmer and you owned cows, you let your cows just wander freely. And if you wanted to grow a patch of vegetables, it was your responsibility to build a, a fence around your vegetables. You didn't fence in your cows, your cows and your pigs, they were turned loose. And if you wanted to grow crops, you had to put a fence around your crops. Now, today, the law is the opposite. If you have livestock, you have to put a fence around your livestock, and you don't have to fence your, your garden to keep somebody else's cows from coming in and eating it. But in those days, um, the way the law was, it was free range. Everybody's cows wandered around and ate whatever they wanted. So he says the last places where the pea vine was still being seen were only in situations where they were shut in from hogs and cattle. In other words, places where somebody built a little fence around a little patch of the old pea vine prairie and, and where that fence has kept out the herds of wandering cows. And, and these herds were huge, hundreds, sometimes thousands of cows, according to the old reports. And the pea vine was disappearing everywhere they went. Now, by 1869, here's, here's one more writer. In many places, the wild pea vine grew as high as a horse's back and the blossoms were very plentiful. The pea was a stalk rather than a vine. It has utterly disappeared from the country and so has the rich and abundant high grass that used to carpet these wild woods. So there we go, um, sort of a sad end. This was, this was from a, a textbook. Um, we, we think of environmental loss and environmental crises as being something that we deal with today. We talk a lot about environmental challenges and different problems, you know, destruction of the rainforest, save the whales. This is a writer from the mid 1800s and children are being taught about this environmental catastrophe that had already happened, the disappearance of the pea vine, um, that it has already utterly disappeared from the country by, you know, 1869 when this was written. Um, it had once been so beautiful and supported so much, and then it was gone. Yeah. Now, you might be wondering, is it possible that these things actually went extinct? You know, when he says utterly disappeared, does he mean like 100% disappeared, extinct, extinct, like the dodo extinct? Well, there were a lot of different kinds of pea vine. Remember, pea vine was not one species. It was a general term. And we know for a fact that some species of wild pea in North Carolina 
actually did go completely, totally extinct in the 1800s. Extinct like the dodo is extinct. Um, this this um, picture right here is a preserved specimen of a, a wild pea that botanists have since called the big leaf scurf pea. It was collected by scientists only twice in 1897 and 1899 from Polk County, North Carolina, and then it was never ever seen again. Um, apparently those were the last ones, and then when those were gone, there were no more. Now you'll notice 1897, 1899, that's actually like way past when people said the pea vine country mostly disappeared. So could there have been other peas that also disappeared before botanists ever discovered them? We, we have no way of really knowing. But we do know at least one species of pea in North Carolina did go extinct during the 1800s, and all that's left of it is, you know, these pressed plants. Um, so, so some extinctions did happen. More may have happened um, before scientists, uh, you know, discovered all the plants' names. So, looking at this, we could uh, we could read from more historical writers to try and get a picture of what these things were like. Since we don't have time machines, um, witnesses who were there um, are the best that we can perhaps do. So what were these things like? Um, we could read from lots of different witnesses who all repeat this: how singularly beautiful they were and how the large prairies turned into forests and how the tall pea vines grew so abundantly here in the North Carolina um, Piedmont, how there were only a few scattered trees back in the 1700s, not thick forests. Um, and in some cases, um, people wrote about having to haul logs for miles in order to build their house because the land was so wide open with so few trees. Um, and they write of the beauty again and again. They, they talk about how the hills and vales covered with the pea vine made it look like, look like a garden. Um, it was so beautiful. So I'm not going to read all of these different historical writers here for you right now, but I just want to see that I'm not, this isn't just one or two quotes. There are many different people um, from the 1700s and 1800s who described this, this pea vine prairie and the importance of the pea vine how it was wide open, scattered trees, how beautiful it was, and then how rapidly it vanished. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's that's a nice word for it. Um, generally, when describing the height, you'll see many, many people would compare the height of the pea vine to a horse. I know many of us do not all have horses today. Um, if, if we compared it to the height of a car's hood, we would all know about how high that is, but they didn't have cars yet. So they would frequently compare the height of the pea vine to the height of a horse's back or even the height of a horse's head in some cases. So this pea vine was um, not short exactly, but it wasn't the size of a tree either. A horse's back is about five feet off the ground. Um, so that gives us an approximate idea of what it was like and all the flowers that grew with it. Now, the decline of the pea vine was also observed by many, many people. Um, we might remember people like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson primarily for their role in American politics, but they also um, were very concerned about the wild pea vine. This was something they were thinking about and writing about. So this is a, a letter uh, to Thomas Jefferson, um, which he received in 1796. Now, he was only writing the Declaration of Independence a few years before this, and now someone is writing to him about the, the pea vine, which is highly nutritious to cattle and which is still known to grow plentifully and spontaneously to the west of the mountains of Virginia and probably was equally plentiful to the east of them, but has already have been carried to its own destruction by its good qualities, meaning the pea vine was so wonderful that it's been destroyed already in Eastern Virginia, and it's still hanging on in Western Virginia, according to this writer. And the writer Strickland is telling Thomas Jefferson, this is highly worthy of your attention, Mr. Jefferson. You've been, you've been focusing on these declarations of independence, but what are you doing about the pea vine? The pea vine is in trouble. Well, many people were noticing this. Um, 
Um, Benjamin Smith Barton, um, professor of botany at the University of Pennsylvania back in the early 1800s, author of the first bot botanical textbook in the United States, wrote in 1807 that no pains are taken to preserve this plant, nor any of the valuable native hedisara, which we call pea vines. Indeed, in many parts of our country, these plants, as well as the buffalo clover and many others, are in a fair way of being totally exterminated. This is 1807, and one of our leading botanists in the young country is concerned that the pea vine is on its way to being totally exterminated. So it's not that no one noticed. He says no pains are being taken to preserve it. He begs for help. Here's another writer from Virginia, um, wrote this. I have often been told by the old people of the astonishing luxuriance of the tall wild pea vine in old times on lands now the poorest of the great quantities of food which it afforded for stock, its vines, its leaves and fruit greedily devoured by horses, cows and sheep so that its very value seems to have caused its utter extermination. With so much worth and so many enemies, is it not entitled to a single friend? Now, that was written in 1833. Is the pea vine not entitled to a single friend? Was how the writer put it. Um, it sounds kind of like modern environmentalism, um, it, but definitely uh, you can hear the, the emotion and the concern in the writer's voice the value of the pea vine and they've witnessed its disappearance and you know in a human lifetime it went from a beautiful landscape to utter extermination um this is uh james davis who was a, a medical doctor an educated man um and describing in in south carolina the situation in 1836 this was he was an old man at the time of this writing he could remember the 1700s he said that South Carolina being incapable of producing a rich supply of grasses, that would be absurd to suppose because he remembers the time himself when almost the whole surface of her soil, especially the upper country, what we call the Piedmont, was a rich natural meadow of the most succulent and nutritious herbage and grasses. And although it is to be feared that many species of the native grasses best adapted to our soil have become extinct by our negligence, yet perhaps it is not the case with all of them. So imagine being an old man and the best thing you can hope for is that perhaps not every plant you remember from your younger days is extinct. Perhaps they're not all extinct. Um, he hopes that by diligent, diligent observation, perhaps a solitary tussock might be found in some unfrequented nook of the old plants that he can remember. Um, you add up all these these descriptions and there was something uh, uh, an enormous environmental change that happened very rapidly and these people saw it so last one this is atkinson from 1861 he describes how in advance of our scratching plow they tell us they found the wild oat and native grasses waving thick as high as a man's head and so entwined with the wild pea vine as to make it difficult to ride among it all over this country. Every cotton planter has heard of these fine primitive pasture ranges and many have seen them. If the country or climate has been cursed in our appearance as planters here, it has been the wasting system that we introduced and continue to practice. So he says, you all remember it. You remember it. You remember the wild pea vine, how thick it was. And if the land seems cursed now, it's our agricultural system that's done it. That's where he puts the blame. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't um, any great mystery. Um, he says, look at the way we've treated the land and, and that's, that's the explanation. So this decline of the pea vine was noticed by many, many people. Um, the most detailed description of exactly how the pea vine disappeared was probably given by Elisha Mitchell. Now, that name should be very familiar to most of us North Carolinians. Elisha Mitchell was a professor at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill in the early 1800s, um, sometimes acting as president there. Um, and he published this that I'm about to read in 1845 in the Raleigh Register. And this is the preface. So Elisha Mitchell, Mount Mitchell, the tallest mountain in, in eastern North America, is named after Elisha Mitchell. Mitchell County, North Carolina, also named after Elisha Mitchell. A brilliant scientific figure. Um, 
and he spent a lot of time in western North Carolina, and he, he saw what was happening there firsthand. And he makes this observation that the families by whom the western North Carolina counties were settled in the early 1800s were originally from below the ridge, from the Piedmont, and they carried with them into the mountains the kind of husbandry to which they had been accustomed to in the warmer and drier parts from which they came. So he's saying that in the mountains, the settlers repeated what they had previously done in the Piedmont, that in the early 1800s, the same process is playing out in the mountains that had previously in the 1700s played out in the Piedmont. It's literally the same settlers carrying the same practices. That's that's what he's he's suggesting here. And then he goes on to describe what was happening. He says, while the Indians held possession of the country, it was burnt over every year. Just let that sink in. The fire destroyed the greater number of the young trees that were springing up, and the large ones remained thinly scattered, like apple trees in an orchard with large open spaces between. In these, the different kinds of native vines and other wild plants, the pea vine, etc., contended for mastery. So he's saying prior to the settlers coming, Native Americans were there, they burnt the land every year. And the fire kept the land open and the trees thinly scattered, big spaces between the trees, so that it looked like he compares it to an orchard. People keep comparing it to a garden or an orchard or the Garden of Eden. Apparently that really was how it felt and it was tended by people. Um, and the pea vine stood out, in fact, Pea vine is the only plant he actually identifies by name in these passages. He just says the wild plants, the pea vine, etc. Pea vine is the only plant worth naming. It was that important. Um, so he says that after the Indians had been removed and large quantities of stock were introduced, the cattle and horses lent their aid in this contest of the different vegetable species in favor of the worst kinds. They ate out and destroyed such as they found palatable and suitable for the nourishment of animals while such as were worthless were permitted to grow and occupy the ground. So he's saying the cows and the horses ate out all the nutritious plants, the pea vine, and the plants that remained were the unnutritious plants. So you have a selective destruction that the free ranging cattle and horses remove the pea vine, and it's the non-nutritious plants that are left behind, natural selection basically. And then in the meantime, he says, the annual firing of the woods that had been practiced by the Indians having ceased, bushes and small trees have overspread and shaded a large space that were formerly covered by herbage. That's just what everybody else was saying, right? The prairies turned into forest. Why did the prairie turn into forest so quickly? What was keeping it as prairie in the first place? Well, Elisha Mitchell tells us the people were burning the land every year. If the people burn the land every year, then of course it was prairie and it couldn't be forest. But if you remove the people who burn the land, if you force them away, Indian Removal Act, remember? Um, if you take away the people who burn the land and there's no one to burn it, then the trees grow up dense, everything is shaded out, and the pea vine and wildflowers can't survive in the shade. So for these two reasons, therefore, he says, because the best kinds of vegetables have been in great measure eaten out and destroyed, and because of the thickening in the forest, the range would be greatly inferior to what it was 50 years ago. So in just a short time, he says 50 years, you would go from the rich pea vine country to the thickets, the dense shade of the new young forest and the destruction of the edible plants and, and the flourishing of the not so edible plants. Well, well, what happens then? I mean, what do people do who moved into an area because of the pea vine and loved the free food for their cows if the pea vine is now gone, then what do you do then? Well, one option was to move away, move to some other state where there were rumors that pea vine still grew. And a lot of them did exactly that. They heard there was pea vine in Tennessee, and so they moved there. They heard there was pea vine in Kentucky, so they moved there. And they chased the pea vine all the way to the Great Plains. Or, Elijah Mitchell suggests, there is an alternative. Introduced plants. He says that given the destruction of the pea vine, it is necessary here that the ingenuity of man must come in to direct and control the operations of nature. The best grasses, best for pasturage, for livestock, must be introduced um, and the land must be converted into artificial pastures. So that is, that is the plan. And he says by this time, there has been considerable progress to the creation of these artificial pastures.
So today, if you look around the land, you will see many, many plants that are not historically native to North Carolina. You'll see things like white clover native to Europe, or you'll see fields of fescue grass, you know, native to Europe. Grasses and plants were brought from other parts of the world, and they were planted to replace the pea vine that had been destroyed. And so that was the way that agriculture could continue after the pea vine uh, had vanished. So Elijah Mitchell um, really lays out the entire, the entire cycle, um, the, the fire that kept the land open, and then the ending of the burning, and then the overgrazing of the stock, and then finally the planting of the introduced grasses and the creation of the artificial patches that bury the old pea vine country once and for all. This is what we end up with, of course. Um, we have to introduce artificial pastures. So um, because the pea vine was what people remembered, people went looking for new kinds of pea vine. And they heard about pea vines from other countries like kudzu and um, things like lespedeza. And so people would get excited because what is kudzu except a gigantic pea vine? Um, and so these things were brought in from other countries and planted, sold as new wonder crops that could replace the old pea vine. But nowadays, um, we see these things as weeds. Um, but why did they bring the kudzus and the lesbedezas in the first place? To replace the old pea vine that had been destroyed. So um, many of our non-native weeds today were brought in as those artificial pasture crops. Um, many of them are actually peas themselves, just not the peas that were here historically. Um, the cows didn't end up liking the lesbides, the new lesbides very much. Um, they liked the, the native ones much better. A little bit of a disappointment. Now, some people were interested in the wild pea vine, you know, cultivating it or somehow bringing it back. Um, in fact, George Washington in his diary, this is way back in you know, 1786, George Washington wrote in his diary, um, about having some of the wild pea vine pulled on his farm. They, he, was, he was trying to experiment with cultivating wild pea vine and, and harvesting it. He was a little disappointed with this experiment. He later wrote that it didn't seem to do so well in cultivation as it did in the wild, but he was at least trying to cultivate it. Um, people were writing to George Washington, and George Washington was writing back about how the, the wild pea might work in cultivation. So he tried growing some wild pea vine from, he says, the eastern shore of Virginia. And now he's writing to Strickland about how the mountain wild pea from western Virginia might do. But he's, he's concerned that even though the wild pea is so nutritious that it might not, it might not grow so well um, on farms. And people had this experience. Um, in, in Georgia, people wrote that the wild pea vine originally grew all over the state. And they suggested that it would be very easy to domesticate. It's easy to say, yes, yes, we're all going to domesticate the wild pea vine and bring it back to feed our cows. But then when they actually try to do that, they wrote, we have, we have tried to save some seed and attempt its cultivation, but the wild pea vine constantly escapes us. Um, look for it on places inaccessible to cattle, as it is never spared where the cows can reach it. They, they have no doubt that if it could be domesticated, the wild pea vine would be, you know, superior to any of these, you know, European peas, but um, they never managed to quite make it work. They tried, they tried, but they, they couldn't quite figure out how to domesticate it. Now, they did notice this, though. Um, after the Civil War, the free range days started to come to an end and laws were passed um, requiring farmers to fence their cattle. And some people noticed that after the new fence laws kept the cattle from ranging freely, many grasses and forest plants thought to have gone extinct reappeared in the land, among them the wild pea. So this was this was encouraging. This was, was encouraging um, that the, the wild pea vine seemed to be reappearing in some places after the fence laws were passed. But there was a problem. Even with the fencing of the cows, the prairies were still being covered with trees. Remember, Elijah Mitchell said, there were two factors that destroyed the pea vine. 
Part of it was the overabundance of the cows, but the other part was the ending of the annual burning. So even with the fence law, because they didn't simultaneously put back the annual bur burning, um, the pea vine continued to disappear. It was a short-lived resurgence after the pea vine. So if you, you wanted to put it all together in a little diagram, this is kind of the, the grand theory of pea vines. Um, if you constrain your large herbivores and you burn your forests regularly, you get lots of pea vines. If you don't burn your forests and you don't constrain your large herbivores, you have very few pea vines. Um, if you do one out of the two, you still get few pea vines. It really takes both to have the luxuriant carpet of pea vines that seems to have been historically described. Um, this is the big picture that I would suggest you could take away from all of these historical records and writers. So question is, if we know this, if we've read all these history books and we've read all these different writers and sources, you've read the, the old professors and you've, you, you've read the old farmers, well, what can we do about it? Can we learn anything from all this? I mean, it seems kind of simple now that it's all laid out. In order to bring the pea vine prairie back, we would need to burn every year and we would need to fence out the big um, plant eaters. And we decided to try that here at Wilkerson Nature Preserve. So right here, um, this is a picture of what is going to be our pea vine experiment. Now looking at it right there, does that look like a prairie? Mm -mm. Very prairie-like? Mm -hmm. Not really, that's the edge of our parking lot. Um, and you can see at the edge of our parking lot is a dense growth of young trees and, and bushes and things. Um, not very prairie-like at all. Um, it's a dense, gloomy tangle. And we decided to see if we could take that and apply what we had learned from the history books. Well, the first step would be we would have to remove all that dense growth, right? They said that the prairie was covered by the dense growth of young trees. So we got to work removing all those young trees. And a lot of them weren't native species either. They were privets and Russian olives and, and all sorts of things, lots of pine trees and cedar trees. So after a few weeks work, we had cleared it all out, leaving only a few of the largest trees behind. So there's our, there's our work group. And you can see the sunlight is now coming in and we've left a few scattered trees and, and we have it all clear. But if we stopped there, well, you know, all those stuff is going to grow right back, right? So in order to keep it from growing back, we've got to burn it. So we started burning that land. This is the same piece of land you saw in the first photo. So that first thicket of trees, this is the exact same spot. And we have burned that land every year for four years in a row now. And we do it in March, um, which is seems to be historically when it was most often done. In fact, in um, the early days of North Carolina colony, it was described they actually had a law requiring the early settlers to burn their woods by, um, by the middle of March every year. This was in the very early days of North Carolina colony. The law was later taken away. Um, so. We're doing the practice. You can see where we're burning the underbrush. And then after the burn, um, we wait to see what happens. Now, there's one more thing you'll see in that picture, too. At the edge of the picture, you can see something else we put up, a fence. See the wire fence? Mm -hmm. Remember the last place the pea vine was seen, according to some writers, was where it was shut in from hogs and cattle, where someone had put a fence up around a little bit of it. So we tried to recreate that. We put up a fence. We remove the dense young forest and we start burning in the winter. And with that combination, yeah, we burn it good. A few months later, this is what we get. This is the same spot that was covered with all that thicket of the, the pine trees and the exotic weeds. This is about three months after burning and the ground is now covered with this carpet, this lush, lush carpet of wild peas. Um, inside this tiny little bit of land, it's not even a tenth of an acre, we found over a dozen different species of native wild peas that just grew spontaneously out of the ground mm 
after we cleared it, fenced it, and burned it. We didn't plant a thing. We planted nothing. We put in no seeds. We put in no plants. But peas are famous for their seed coats. They have hard seed coats, and their seeds can sleep in the soil for long, long periods of time. And they will wait for the right conditions in order to germinate. And for these peas that had were, were so flourishing in the past with the annual burning, they were just waiting for that to come back. Remember, the pea vine prairie was vast. It was huge. So we just picked a little piece of land at random, but the pea vine prairie was so much of everything that it didn't really matter where we picked all so much. All these peas were just sleeping in the soil, and they make this wonderful carpet. And now this is midsummer, so they're only a couple feet high here. But by the end of the summer, they get taller and taller, and you can start to see some of them are flowering here. They got little yellow flowers and pink flowers. And then some of them have these pink flowers, and these are the stalky ones. Um, so if you stood beside these, these would be about five feet tall, the tall ones, which is about as high as a horse's back. Now, I don't have a horse to show you in this picture, but take my word for it. These things get about five feet tall. So this is a list of all the different wild peas we found. So I know these are fancy scientific names, but all of these different things would have been called wild pea vine back in the day. So some of these have names like partridge pea or milk pea, or um, some of them have fun names like wild coffee or, um, you know, some of them um, pencil flower, but um, they're all different members of the pea family and some are more or less common, lots of different species. And we didn't know these were there at all until we burned. Um, so this is a close up photo of, of one of those those peas. This one is actually a favorite of mine because it's um, it's a hybrid. It's a naturally occurring hybrid of two of those other species. It's very rare. Um, but uh, it does occur when the peas become abundant. It's only been seen in North Carolina a few times. So some of the peas have big flowers, some of them have very small flowers, um, but if you take a close look at them, I think many of them are quite beautiful. And that was something that so many of the writers described, the beauty of the pea vines. Almost like little tiny um, birds or butterflies when you look at them up close. And of course, um, pea flowers um, are good nectar plants, and they are chiefly pollinated by bees. So if you want to support native bees, there's really nothing better for bees than peas. Bees and peas are meant to go together. Um, so when you have the pea vines, then the wild bees have what they need to, to really flourish. Now, yeah, so there's a little, a little picture of it in midsummer. Just so, you can see a little bit of the diversity here. So you can see there's low creeping ones down in the bottom of the frame. There's ferny looking peas. There's stalky looking peas. Lots and lots of different kinds. Now, the pea vine community was more than just peas. I want to point this out. Um, everybody mentioned the peas first. The peas were the plant that dominated this community. But it was more than just peas. So writers would say, Flowers of every description would grow all around the wild pea and wildflowers of every hue. It was not 100% peas. There were other things. And we have had other things also come up in our, our pea vine restoration. Um, you may recognize this plant. It um, is the ancestor of a plant that we grow on farms today and we sell in our supermarkets. This is its native wild form, um, our wild Virginia strawberry. Now, all the writers who described this area in the time of early settlement um, observed the strawberries here in the Virginia and the Carolinas. Um, so here's just a few descriptions. Um, this is from 1706. Strawberries they have as delicious as any in the world and growing almost everywhere in the woods and fields. They are eaten almost by all creatures and yet are so plentiful that very few persons take care to transplant them, but can find enough to fill their baskets when they have a mind in the deserted old fields. So in, in 1706, there were so many strawberries that nobody bothered to grow them in gardens because you could just fill baskets with the wild strawberries whenever you wanted to because these old fields, these old prairies or savannas or whatever you want to call them, were just overflowing with wild strawberries. Um, 
John Lawson here in 1709 in North Carolina said, strawberries grow here in great plenty. That was his description of North Carolina. Um, Catesby, the famous naturalist in the later 1700s, said strawberries are only of the wood kind and grow naturally in all parts of the country, except where hogs frequent. Uh, now there's the livestock again. Remember the hogs, they just turn them loose. And the cows, they just turn them loose. And so these early writers in the early 1700s, before the settlers come, so many wild strawberries, wild strawberries everywhere. Your baskets overflow with wild strawberries. But then mm -hmm. once the livestock comes, the strawberries start to disappear. Now, today there is a plant that resembles a strawberry that is very, very common. You may find it in lawns and roadsides and sidewalks, and it has a little red berry that resembles a strawberry. That is not the plant in these pictures. Um, that common lawn weed, sometimes called the mock strawberry, it was introduced from Asia. It's not related to the strawberry that we eat. It doesn't taste like a strawberry. It's a completely different plant. It just has a superficial resemblance. This plant that you're seeing in these photos that grew in our pea patch, this is the true wild strawberry, the Virginia strawberry. This is the strawberry that grows mixed. You can see the pea vine growing with the strawberry in the photos. That's the pea vine creeping all around it. So the strawberry and the pea vine really grew well together. And when you taste one of these, they taste like a strawberry. Like you can tell this is the ancestor of all the strawberries that we grow on farms today, growing wild. The only place I've ever seen them making fruit is in our, um, our pea enclosure. Um, they used to be everywhere, so you will find little stunted wild strawberry plants all over the place, but they usually never make fruit unless you get a mass of them growing together. Um, strawberry requires um, pollination in order to set fruit. So unless you have a whole lot of them growing together with lots of flowers open at the same time to get cross pollination between plants, none of them make fruits. So for several years, we watched these plants and there was no fruits and no fruits. But then after the fourth year of burning, the amount of strawberries had reached a sort of critical mass where there were so many flowers that I guess the bees started getting the cross pollination and then fruits everywhere. Um, so this sort of, I believe the old stories now. I believe the old stories about filling the baskets. Um, you can see in the picture of the right, that was a group of students who came to Wilkerson um, this spring and everybody could pick all, they, everybody got a strawberry. They, they, they started just fruiting abundantly and they all say they were very good. Um, so it's not just peas. The, the pea vine prairie had other plants too, like the wild strawberry growing right along with it. Um, now this is, another plant that has surprised us. You know, they did say that there were wildflowers of every hue. Um, this is not an edible plant, but it's it's just a pretty one. It's 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 called a star grass. It has these bright yellow six petaled flowers. And you'll notice in the picture the ashes of the leaves and, and, and pine needles right around it. So these these plants you see in this picture burn were burned in March, and they started making these flowers just a few weeks later. We have been watching this piece of land very carefully every spring for many, many years. And I never saw these yellow flowers blooming there until the first time we burned it. Um, stargrass species, many of them are strongly fire dependent, and their flowering is stimulated by fire. Um, after we saw these blooming, we started searching more carefully and we found that there were actually quite a few star grasses there in the area around our burn zone, but only the ones that actually got burned bloomed. The ones that were outside of the burn zone made no flowers whatsoever. So the star grass plants that were inside the burn zone, almost 100% of them made flowers this spring. But the ones that were just outside of the burn zone, just a, a few yards away, literally, not one of them, not even one, made even one flower. The, they were 100% stimulated by burning um, here in our, our population this spring. So it just goes to show how we're still finding surprises, how when you bring back the, the burning regime that you see plants that, who knows how long these plants have been waiting to bloom. Um, waiting for a fire to come.
but this this species, the the star grass, um, is is known to do this, known to be strongly um, fire dependent to stimulate its flowering. So they're they're quite beautiful, um, even though each flower only lasts for a few hours. They open in the morning and they usually close up by the afternoon. Um, but the ones that didn't get burned don't make any flowers at all, or at least we haven't seen any flower yet. Only the burned ones bloomed. Mm -hmm. um, one last flower. So this is this is not a pea. Um, we did not know this plant grew at Wilkerson until after we started doing our, our, our pea prairie restoration. This is an edible plant, though. Um, it's called redwood lettuce. It is a true lettuce. It is related to the lettuce that we eat, um, and you can eat it. It's very nutritious. Um, it has reddish purple stems and red yellow flowers. You can see the flowers there. Um, it was once upon a time a common flower. So, you know, a hundred years ago when um, Frederick Stack published the book, Wildflowers Every Child Should Know, um, the red wood lettuce was one of those wildflowers that every child should know a hundred years ago. This was a common flower. Every child ought to know about the red wood lettuce. It's a beautiful flower that everyone can see in, in you know, open woods. And um, it, it has pretty flowers and everyone should know it. Well, um, it was once a widespread flower found all across the Eastern United States. Um, but today, when you look around, some states say it's disappeared completely. Maryland seems to be extinct. Connecticut seems to be extinct. District of Columbia, extinct. Or it's endangered. It's endangered in New York and Illinois, or threatened in Ohio and Indiana and Vermont, or it's got some other watch list special status in a number of other states. In North Carolina, only one specimen of redwood lettuce has been collected anywhere in the state in the last 50 years. One. Um, no one had seen it in the Piedmont of North Carolina in, in 50 years. Um, and I had never seen it myself. Um, but after we started burning, it just appeared. It just popped up and started blooming. And now it blooms every year. We burn every year. And so it blooms every year. So there was a time when it, it was probably very, very common. And then it became very, very rare. And that's why so many states have, have listed it. But to bring it back, all you have to do is kind of find follow the recipe in the history books. Um, if you bring back the pea vine community, you get all these other plants that were part of the pea vine community. They aren't even pea vines, but they all grew together. And they combine to provide that beautiful garden-like, all these flowers blooming together. Of course, you know, the deers and the cows would love the wood lettuce. It's a lettuce. It's delicious. It's tasty. You can just eat the leaves. So if you let the cows or the deer or the things come and eat it, they chew it all down to nothing. But with a little bit of protection, um, it grows beautifully. So that's that's my, um, my talk. And it is just at an hour. So... I'm stopping sharing my screen and I'm back. So I think I ended on time. I don't know if anyone has any questions, but um, I hope you've appreciated learning a little bit about the historic ecosystems of North Carolina and surrounding states and how we bring them back here at Wilkerson Nature Preserve. And we hope that um, you've enjoyed this tour. Hi, uh, I'm amazed. I'm impressed. I had no idea about this story whatsoever. And I'm just... Um, I, it was also kind of like cliffhanger listening to a, a drama, you know, did you actually be able to bring them back? And then you did. And I was also happy. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I was trying to do like research beforehand, trying to figure out what it was because I had never heard of it. And there was like so little information out there. So it's so it's so interesting, like that it really did just disappear. And I was wondering, are there like plans to bring it back? back anywhere else like do you, that you happen to know of other places that are doing similar projects or um that's a great question um so it's it's kind of strange so in the old history books they you saw you like they, they all talk about the pea vine and they talk about how it disappeared and they talk about trying to cultivate it or bring it back um but then in the 1900s that all kind of comes to a stop. And history books stop talking about how the pea vine had once existed. And instead, they start telling a different story about how America was forest from the Atlantic to the Mississippi. And a squirrel could go from the Atlantic coast to the Mississippi River by hopping from tree to tree without touching the ground, because it was all a vast, unbroken forest. 
I'm, I'm literally kind of paraphrasing a common textbook that a lot of colleges in North Carolina use today. This, you, have you ever heard this story about the squirrel who can go forever without touching the ground back in the old days? No one ever said that in the 1700s, all right? Um, that was a description made up way later to try and encourage the planting of forests. So for the last hundred years, um, there was for many years an emphasis on suppressing fire, you know, Smokey the Bear, only you can prevent forest fires. Fire is dangerous and bad and scary. And that was a big concern. And they they stopped talking about the pea prairies, which were fire dependent and all these other plants like the stargrass that doesn't burn at all. It doesn't seem to bloom at all unless you burn it. Um, so for many years, it was just forgotten. Um, recently, more people have started looking back and saying, you know, maybe planting trees everywhere isn't actually restoring all the wildlife that we would like to come back. Like, why do bobwhite quail numbers keep getting lower and lower and lower and lower? Even though we have more trees than ever, we have fewer quail than ever. Um, well, maybe the quail actually prefer a more open country more open space and you know the favorite food of quail all the quail biologists will tell you this favorite food of quail wild peas they love the wild peas mm -hmm. some of the peas are actually named partridge pea like that's the name of the pea because mm -hmm. they saw the partridges or the quails eating them so so avidly that's literally what they named the pea um so for biologists who are interested in species like that um, they are trying to see how they can bring back these plants because then animals that they care about benefit too. So if you, you care about native bees, nothing is better for native bees than peas. Um, care about native birds? Many of our, our birds that are in the most um, decline could be greatly helped by more of these, these peas and the whole pea community. Um, so some people are working on it, but for so long, people were taught forests, plant trees, make forest. But the, the actual historical witnesses say the forest grew up after the colonists came and replaced the prairies. Um, so it, it's tough sometimes to change conceptions about forest is the most natural thing. Um, but when you look back at the history, uh, more and more people are, are realizing that. Aww. Trees are great, but you need more than just trees to have a balanced ecosystem. Other plants too. Well, um, thanks. And uh, I, I invite anyone who wants to see any of this to, to visit us here at Wilkerson. You can see it in person. If you come in season, you can eat the wild strawberries um, <laughs> and uh, you can nibble the wood lettuce. It tastes like lettuce though, I'll be honest. It tastes like lettuce. Um, and uh, we, we hope to have more and more of them every year. Awesome. I, I do need to leave, but I so appreciate it hearing from you. Okay. Good thank night. you. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Awesome. See you in the recording. <laughs>